The San Francisco plague was one of the most troubling cases of the plague ever to affect the United States. But what was it that prompted medical officials to act so airheadedly? Welcome to today's video, where we'll be taking a look at the San Francisco plague and all the trouble it brought for the California population while it lasted. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and turn notifications on for more videos like this one. Also known as the Black Death, the bubonic plague ravaged Europe and Asia for many centuries until, in the 20th century, it came to America somehow. The events that unfolded in San Francisco from 1899 to 1901, still being researched and written about more than a century later, represented one of the most infamous chapters in U.S. public health history. Similar to how the COVID-19 pandemic spread by innocent travelers who had no idea that they were infected while they were, in the summer of 1899, a ship sailing from Hong Kong to San Francisco had two bubonic cases on board. After a farewell dinner put on by Washington's medical elite, Joseph James Kenyon arrived in San Francisco to learn that this same plague ship was bound from Honolulu. Although Kenyon found no plague on board, two similar scares followed within the next few weeks. The second of these prompted California and the federal government to take action fast. Kenyon eventually learned that the plague had broken out in Honolulu, making it also inevitable that infected ships would soon arrive in San Francisco. Apparently, no passengers were ill when the ship reached San Francisco, but it was to be quarantined on Angel Island. Once the boat was searched, 11 stowaways were found. Strangely enough, two of those were missing the next day. Some bodies were found in the bay and an autopsy showed that they were infected by the plague bacilli. Bad news for the public, who was morbidly scared of the possible outcome knowing how a big part of the Eurasian population had been wiped out by the merciless Black Death. However, there wasn't any immediate outbreak of the disease until nine months had passed. In the meantime, Kenyon had to handle two smallpox epidemics in U.S. Army troops returned from Manila, suffer four recurrent episodes of appendicitis, and also inspect hundreds of the incoming Asian immigrants for their diseases and deformities, even making a difficult decision about one potential Japanese immigrant with a severe hand deformity. Kenyon overlooked the man's otherwise excludable condition and authorized his immigration. The man in question, Hideo Noguchi, not only became Kenyon's friend and an acclaimed microbiologist, but could have even won the Nobel Prize had he not died early due to his research elucidating cases of syphilis. In 1864, two research physicians had identified the bacillus that caused the bubonic plague, but little was known about the transmission, treatment, or prevention methods. It was even labeled a racial disease that people of European ancestry were immune to because European expatriates in colonial India and Hong Kong rarely caught diseases that ravaged the deprived, crowded communities outside their compounds. People in different parts of the world were credited with the discovery depending on which journals they had read. Scientists theorized that the germ infected humans through food or open wounds. However, despite not having enough information on the plague to know exactly how people got infected, health officials didn't stop there until they found more information regarding possible cases. On March 6, 1900, a city health officer autopsied a deceased Chinese man, finding organisms in the body that heavily resembled the plague. Things got so tense that they even began running carbolic acid through Chinatown sewers, which ironically actually spread the disease faster because it flushed out rats that inhabited the sewers. In San Francisco, however, political issues had gone against scientific efforts. Anti-Chinese feeling prompted the authorities to quarantine Chinatown first, and though they objected, the business community did the same. One of the few public health officials capable to provide with a diagnosis for the plague had arrived in San Francisco not long beforehand. His name was Joseph Kenyon, a veteran of the Federal Marine Hospital Service in Washington, D.C. Kenyon's tests on samples confirmed the plague's presence, though political and popular pressure had already prompted the local Board of Health to lift the quarantine. From that point on, Kenyon was warring with more than the bacillus. Medical authorities, politicians, the press, and the quarantine-averse public resisted his efforts. Kenyon was hampered, too, by intellectual arrogance. The hostility to science and its measures also prompted quite a lot of trouble. For example, Louisiana and Texas had threatened a state border closure, while California Governor Henry Gage was concerned that other states would suspect a problem with his state's annual $25 million fruit harvest, disparaging the plague as fake in a letter to the U.S. Secretary of State John Hay and issued threats to anyone publishing on it. 
When dawn came on March 7, 1900, Chinatown was circled by rope and surrounded by policemen preventing egress or access to anyone but whites. The 12-block area was surrounded by four streets, Broadway, Kearney, California, and Stockton. The widespread racism expressed towards Chinese immigrants did not help matters at the time of the Chinatown plague, with standard social rights and privileges being mostly denied to the Chinese people. Even landlords would refuse to maintain their own property when renting the Chinese immigrants. Most of the Chinatown community's living conditions reflected the social norms and racial inequalities during that time for Chinese people. Things got so heated up that discrimination for the Chinese Americans prompted two acts to be published, the Quarantine of San Francisco's Chinatown and the Permanent Extension of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Chinese immigrants were seen as disease carriers without them even having actual evidence of bubonic plague. Because San Francisco's measures were discriminatory and segregatory, allowing European Americans to leave the affected area due to their perceived immunity, but prompting Chinese and Japanese immigrants to possess a health certificate to leave the city, wide misinformation and mass hysteria were commonplace during the time. And that's not even speaking of the widespread dissent among those who had jobs outside of San Francisco, as they were prevented from working. Few Chinese agreed to take the inoculation, especially after press reports on May 22, 1900, that people who did agree were experiencing severe pain from the untested vaccine. On May 24, 1900, with the help of six Chinese companies, they hired the law firm of Reddy, Campbell, and Metzen. Defendants included Joseph J. Kenyon and all of the members of the San Francisco Board of Health. The Chinese wanted the courts to issue a provisional injunction to enforce what they argued was their constitutional right to travel outside of San Francisco. The plague outbreak continued to worsen between 1901 and 1902, with a 1901 address to both houses of the California State Legislature and Gage accusing federal authorities, particularly Kenyon, of injecting plague bacteria into cadavers, falsifying evidence of their infection. For many upper and middle class white San Franciscans, the first sign something was wrong in Chinatown on March 7, 1900, were their empty kitchens. Kenyon infected a few guinea pigs and a monkey. A few days after the call definitively declared it a plague scare, all the animals died. San Francisco Mayor James Phelan ordered 100 doctors to make a sweep of Chinatown, knocking on every door and identifying every possible plague case. It sent terror through the Chinese community, which was fearful of what had happened if a plague victim was found in their homes. Given that just a couple months before, 4,000 homes were burned to the ground in Honolulu's Chinatown during a plague outbreak. In April 1901, Texas's governor declared he would cut off all trade with California if they didn't prove they'd handled their obvious plague epidemic. We have little confidence in the California authorities, he said. In the absence of proof, he considered the state's silence on the matter to be evidence enough that things were bad in San Francisco. Kenyon was eventually denied vindication after his defamation campaign and was promptly sent to Michigan to be replaced by Robert Blue. The state governments of Colorado, Texas, and Louisiana imposed quarantines of California by 1902. As the 1902 general elections approached, members of the Southern Pacific Board and the Railroad Republican faction saw Gage as an embarrassment to the state Republicans because of his haphazard and harebrained measures to deny the plague outbreak to protect the state's economy, which were quickly proven incorrect by federal agencies and newspapers. In his place, former mayor of Oakland George Party, a German-trained medical physician, received the nomination. Party's nomination was largely a compromise between the railroad Republican factions. Even in his final speech, Gage continued to deny the outbreak. Railroad barons were very irritated at this situation, demanding state officials to do something about it. This prompted California to clean up Chinatown. Unsafe and unsanitary buildings were also demolished and rebuilt. Rats were killed, rotting floors were replaced, and the epidemic was temporarily halted. However, when the plague cropped back up in 1907, it was found among some white residents, both in Oakland and San Francisco, with officials jumping into action immediately and spending $2 million to trap and kill rats, just over $55 million today. The second wave happened because in 1906, an earthquake of record proportions devastated San Francisco. The ruin of the city's buildings made not just people, but rats, homeless. The subsequent year or two of living in refugee camps while rebuilding was highly conducive to rat and flea infestations. In 1907, cases of plague were reported. 
But with hindsight on the last epidemic and new knowledge from research, officials launched a new kind of campaign. They offered a bounty on rats. A similar rat catching campaign had been used successfully to fight plague in New Orleans. It worked as well in San Francisco, and though this second epidemic was stronger than the first, it was brought to a halt in 1909. It wasn't until November of 1908 when San Francisco was finally declared plague-free, prompting Blue to become the Surgeon General. However, the disease had somehow crossed into the wild squirrel population, prompting an average of seven people a year, most of them hikers, to become infected in the United States and treated with antibiotics. Sadly, Dr. Kenyon's career never recovered, but his earlier accomplishments in bringing first-class research to the health sciences field were not forgotten. In a 2012 paper, two researchers praised a man they called the Forgotten Forefather who helped birth the National Institutes of Health. His only apparent mistake was being honest about the plague's reality with good intentions at heart and not attempting to suppress it for political or economical gain. Even with new plague cases appearing in the state, Governor Gage refused to admit the existence of plague. So, what are your thoughts on all the trouble caused by the San Francisco plague? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, don't forget to leave us a like, share this video with your friends, and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time for more.